record as well. Sweet. So now it's recording. All right. Let's talk about this stuff, shall we? So the way that I approach these acid-base problems is sort of as the following. And um, Brie, I'm probably, if you have your notes from earlier today, if you could just screenshot those and send them to me so I can have a couple of references because I forgot to save them earlier. That would be great. Um, thank you. Um, cool. So the, what's important to know about acid-base chemistry is that we always go back to this definition about um, Bronsted-Lowry, all right? So we're talking about this Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases, which if you remember, is this setup of HA plus B, go, wait, am I showing, can you, you guys can see the screen, right, as well? Um, goes to A minus plus HB plus. Just to confirm, you guys can see this, right? Someone throw something in the chat for me. Okay, sweet. Now we can keep going. And so as we know, just as a as kind of a refresher, that this base is going to pick up the proton and that that's what's going to create uh, this into a base and that this is what creates an acid and then we have the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. So what I want you to know is that this formula here and then likewise we know that this conjugate base will pick up from the conjugate acid and then we have this kind of duality going on. What I want you to know is that this is a combined equilibrium equation. Okay so What's going on here is really, we're talking about HA dissociating into H plus plus the conjugate base. And we're also talking about H plus plus B associates into HB plus. So we have two equations going on here. And this is the big thing and the big key thing for approaching these ionization questions because it tells us a lot of information. By setting up our equations this way, on the left-hand side, we have for our species A, or for our drug that we care about, we have the unprotonated versions. This is the same thing as saying unionized, non-ionized. They're all saying the same thing here. Likewise, on the right-hand side of the equation, for our drugs A or for our drug B, we're talking about the protonated version, or we're talking about the ionized version, all right? And so with this idea, we can use this to help us set up a table and a little uh, mnemonic um, to be able to understand it. So A is, this A minus here is not protonated. Uh, whoops, ha ha ha, wrote it on the wrong side. My mistake, I flopped them. Whoops, this should be unprotonated and this should be unionized. My bad, thank you for the catch. All right, once again, just to uh, fix what I just said, ha ha ha, is that this is the protonate, what am I saying here? I'm getting all screwed up. I need to look at my references, sorry everyone. Ah, that's how I do it. Okay. We're going to come into this later. Let's take out the protonated version for a second. We'll come back and we'll talk about this in a moment, but let's check these definitions. All right. Now I'm getting myself situated. Okay. If you look on this side, what do you notice about the charges associated with our drug molecules A or our drug molecule B? These are unionized drugs, all right? These do not contain charges. Ionized is just a fancy way of saying charge. So when we're talking about ionized, some uh, unionized molecules, we're talking about uncharged molecules. So if on the exam he's talking about uh, we're talking about 
uh, oh, what's you know the charge molecule going on here? We're talking about either the ion that's being produced. Same thing over here. For our drug molecule A or for our drug molecule B, we're talking about an ionized molecule. Go ahead. Someone had, someone had something to say. Right. So acids, when acids are, when acids are here, they're non-ionized, right? Here, we're talking about the conjugate acid, right? So we're not necessarily talking about the, uh, we're not talking about the, the structure on its own. We're talking about the conjugate about what's being said. Does that kind of sort of make sense in a way? The reason why, the reason why we set up the equations this way is because what it does is it puts all of the neutral charges on one side and it puts all the charged species on the other side. And so what's important to know about acids and bases is that for the base to be, for a base to act as an acid, or in other words, we're talking about the conjugate acid of the base, it needs to have a proton, which in all intents and purposes is a um, positively charged conjugate acid. Let me give you an example. Here we have the functional group, an imine, right? As we know, this is listed as a basic functional group, right? So what we're saying is that this functional group here, this imine is basic. However, we say it has a pKa, I think, of three and a half, right? So, however, how can a basic functional group have a pKa, an acidity constant? How is that possible? Well, the reason is because we're not describing the imine, we're describing the protonated amine. Right? Because in order for something to be an acid, acids have to donate a proton. If we look at the imine by itself, this thing doesn't even have a proton to be able to donate. So how can it even act as an acid? Versus when we look at the protonated imine, oh, it has that proton that's able to donate. And so this pKa here does not describe the imine it describes the protonated amine. Or in other words, we could say that the imine is the base and the protonated amine is the conjugate acid. And so if we wanted to write this as, to play off of our equation, this is the base plus a hydrogen creates our conjugate acid. Does this make sense? Cool. This idea about pKa's only describing acidic structures is integral to understanding how acid-base chemistry works because we cannot ever describe a basic functional group with a pKa, with an acidity constant. You can't do it. It's not possible. So what we're always thinking about is that the pKa will only ever describe an acid, whether that's the real acid by itself or the conjugate acid that's produced, okay? Let's take a look at an acidic functional group. By contrast, if we look at something that's an acidic functional group, like a carboxylic acid, What we know about the carboxylic acid is that it can go from the carboxylic acid form to the carboxylate. Carboxylic acid to the carboxylate. All right. We know that the pKa of the structure is about four and that this structure is described as acidic. Well, if we look, 
here is the proton that gets donated. So this can act as an acid. And so if we wanted to write this in terms of our equilibrium equation that we were talking about above, that it dissociates into the conjugate base plus the acid. Any questions, anything like this? Does this make sense? Is it just a new way of describing things, stuff like that? All right, let's talk about, well, how does this play into when we're talking about acid and base chemistry and we're doing the problems in the book? So what I'm gonna do is I'm doing in the uh, practice, what is this? The, uh, the practice one he set out, that, that set of um, problems um, we're gonna be doing, I think this is, the first acid and base problem. So I'll draw it out. And I'm just going to copy and paste these structures for me. We'll modify them as we talk about what's happening with the pH, everything like that. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So I think this is problem one or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. You can find it if you need to. Um, so how do we approach problems like this and how do we talk about well, what's going on? So first steps first is we have to identify our functional groups, right? So here is the sulfonamide, the sulfonamide, and here is our guanidine, right? And as we talk about this pK, this at pH one, I'll have to grab this later, is let's see how we go about describing these structures. So a sulfonamide, uh, God, I should know this, has a pK of seven and a half. Someone wanna double check me in the chat. And we know that this is a basic structure, I believe. I really should memorize, have these memorized. And guanidine has a pK of 12 and a half and is also a basic structure. Cool. So what I should do, what I should think about this is this fact that comes from test one, semester one, organic chemistry that I'm actually doing with the orgo students right now is that mother nature, the beautiful bitch herself, will always, always, always choose the weaker acids. It could be acidic. Um, I can't remember. If someone wants to just double check for me. I don't have these memorized yet. Mother Nature will always, always, always ha choose the weaker acid to survive. So this is what we're going to do to help us set up these equations, all right? For the sulfonamide above, we know that based on the functional group that we're going to be choosing the equilibrium equation, HA goes to H plus plus A minus. All right. Based on this, what we're going to do is we're going to label this equation with some of the values that are given. We know that A is the drug and that sulfonamides are an acidic group. So we're going to label underneath HA with the pKa, seven and a half. 
Likewise, we're talking about pH. So pH is like we're talking about the pKa, but it's like the pKa of the solution. So where we're going to label is we're going to label H plus with the pH. Because this H plus is representing the solution. Free H pluses that are just floating around in solution. And as we know, that I didn't write in, but I should have, is that this is an equilibrium. Right? So based on our rule about mother nature, which acid is weaker based on these two values? Well, it's going to be seven and a half. All right? So we are going to choose the arrow that faces the, uh, the, lower, the weaker acid or the higher pKa, and that's going to tell us the form that's going to be chosen. All right? So according to this, the form that's going to survive is the protonated version, so, which means that our group that we're going to write for our answer has to stay protonated. So, which is why when we do these acid-based problems, the sulfonamide in this problem is still protonated because it is the weaker acid and it is what is favored in the, at this pH. Does this make sense? Any questions, anything like that that I can answer? Going on to the guanidine down below, we know that this is a basic functional group. So we're going to be choosing the equation H plus plus B creates HB plus, this equilibrium equation that we were talking about. And once again, B represents our structure. So remember, I can't label this as with a pKa because this is not an acid. This is a base. I have to label the conjugate acid with the pKa. So I'm going to give that 12 and a half. Likewise, the H plus represents the pH, so this is going to be 1. Once again, we refer to Mother Nature, and Mother Nature will always choose the weaker acid, which in this case is the 12 and a half. So this is why the protonated form of the guanidine is favored, and which is why in our answer, we're not going to have NH, we're going to have NH2 plus. Does this make sense? Does anybody have any questions about how we got to this answer? Mother Nature does not care, only about the pKa. So charges, um, Mother Nature will just choose the weaker acid regardless of charge because the charge is associated with the pKa value. So she considers it when she chooses, is what you could say. Good question. All right, let's do the 7.4 one. For pH of 7.4, we're also going to be seeing similar results. We know that this sulfonamide is still acidic group, still has a pKa of 7.5. This guanidine is still a basic group, and it still has a pKa of 12.5. Once again, we set up the equation. So we know that this is an acidic group, so we're going to choose the acidic equilibrium equation. Again, we're going to make sure that we're labeling the correct structures. So this is the acid. So we're going to label that 7.5. And, and that this H plus represents the solution. So we're going to label that 7.4. And then based on our rule about Mother Nature, who's she going to choose? Well, the weaker acid is technically still the functional group. So we're going to be choosing towards the 7.5. Although 
because it's so close, uh, I, honestly, it would be like 51, 49% if you were to officially do this. But for the answer that's the correct one is the protonated one. So the answer here is the protonated sulfonamide group. Cool. Back down to the basic. And so we're going to be choosing the correct uh, equilibrium equation for us. Once again, we're going to be labeling H plus with the pKa, which in this case is 7.4. We're going to be labeling HB plus with the pKa because this is the conjugate acid. We have to, we, oh, whoops. My mistake. H plus gets labeled as 7.4. And that this is the conjugate acid, so this gets labeled as 12 and a half. And then once again, we follow the rule of Mother Nature, and Mother Nature will choose the protonated form, which then makes this. For those of you who tutored with me in Orgo, this is the exact same stuff that we did back then. It just looks a little bit different. How do we feel about this? Good? Enough? Kind of? Sort of? Want to do another practice? All right, let's do it. I, mean, I have the thing, so I get to decide what we do. All right, so we have this drug. I don't know what drug this is, but it doesn't really matter. We'll call it Henry. This is Henry the drug. Actually, it kind of looks like a Dave. We'll call it Dave the drug. This is Dave the drug. It's like a little hand that's waving. This is the face. This is like a, a leg. Maybe he's like an amputee, so he doesn't have like this arm or that leg. Um, stuff like that. All right. So we're talking about this is pH equals one. And same thing, first steps first, identify the functional group. So we have this, which is an aromatic amine, or it's also a pyridine. The aromatic amines are, uh, have a pKa of two. I believe someone's gonna have to fact check me. And I believe these are basic functional groups. Please someone fun fact check me. Likewise, this functional group is a phenol. Phenols have a pKa around nine and that these are acidic groups. And then finally, we have this amine or imine hanging around, which we know has a pKa around three and a half and is a basic functional group. So with that in mind, we can now talk about what's gonna happen at our pHs and describe what's gonna happen. So you have to do this check for each functional group that you see, okay? You cannot ignore a functional group. So for this one up here, it's a basic functional group. So we're going to be choosing the basic equilibrium equation. We're going to be labeling H plus with, a P, with the pH of 1. And we're going to be labeling HB plus with the pKa of 2. And once again, we go by the rule of Mother Nature. And Mother Nature will always choose the weaker acid, which is why in this problem, the Pyridine is protonated.
going on to this phenol down below, we know that phenol is an acidic group, so we're going to be choosing the acidic equilibrium equation. And once again, we can label it in that HA has a pKa of 9, because that's describing the uh, structure. And we're going to label this H plus with 1, because that's describing the solution. And so Mother Nature will always choose the weaker acid, which in this case is 9. So the phenol is going to stay protonated, which is why it is protonated over here. Finally, for the imine, we know an imine is basic, so we're going to be choosing the basic equilibrium equation. This has a pKa of, uh, pH of 1. We're going to label this with a pH, the pKa of 12 and a half. Mother Nature will do the thing that she's best at, and so this imine is going to be protonated, which is why it is H+. Does this make sense? Is this process easier than whatever you were trying to do, or is it more complicated, or what kind of feedback can you provide for me? Um, put thumbs up in the chats if you're like, great, I understand this, this is nice, um, move on. Um, or let me know your questions as well. Yeah, so I, if, if the notes section is turned off, then you're just going to have to do this in your head, um, unfortunately enough. Uh, I advocated to have a piece of paper available for us, but the, um, yeah, that Mahana kind of shut that down. Mahana is the program coordinator for the PharmD chemistry. So what Mahana says um, goes, unfortunately enough. Um, so, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, cool. Any questions about this? Does this make sense? Can you see how you can just swap out the pH of one um, and do something else? Sure, I can go over the one you sent me. Um, so I think you said seven and 15. How do I like turn this? Um, I can't. Oh yeah, by the way, Emily Buttermore is running for PharmD Senator. Highly recommend. She's probably the best person for the choice. Um, so uh, for one of your PharmD Senators, definitely choose Emily. I trust her implicitly. Uh, uh, she was also your, um, the, Oh, it should be three and a half. Thank you, Brianna. Um, she's also was the first person to win Assassin uh, last year. So she's your, uh, um, uh, what did I call it? Kill Queen. No, no, no. She won Master Assassin. That's what it was. God, I am really tired. Sorry. All right. Um, John brings up a good uh, question that we can actually do is, well, what if you're not given a structure? Like, what if what if you're given a question, actually this is transitioning into our next topic about how do we determine ionization and stuff like that? Well, or percent protonation or a whole bunch of different things. Well, remember that if we have something like naproxen sodium, or if we have something like morphine sulfate, these names clue you in on what we can expect, all right? Because remember that if we have some sort of counter charge, like a sodium, or if we have some sort of 
countercharge like a sulfate, whatever this is countering has to be the opposite. So for things like uh, sodium, potassium, lithium, calcium, these all came from strong bases. All right, these are all strong bases. So if we are conjugating a drug with a base, that means that naproxen must be an acidic drug. Okay, likewise, things like sulfate, uh, nitrate, uh, hydrochloric, these all come, came from strong acids. And so if they come from strong acids, they must be strong acids. And so that makes the drug basic. Does that make sense? So what does this really tell us? Does I mean, you know, does this affect the pKa? No. The fact that a drug is acidic or basic doesn't really tell us where the pKa is going to lie. You can have an acidic drug that has a very, very high pKa, meaning a very weak acid. What it tells us is which equation are we going to choose? Are we going to choose the acidic equilibrium equation? Or are we going to be choosing the basic equilibrium equation? Okay? So that's how this piece about O oh, paired with a basic ion or paired with an acidic ion plays into what we're talking about. Um, uh, we might get to, actually, John, now that I'm thinking about it, we'll probably get to the questions you sent to me in a little bit because I think they fit in better with a different topic we're going to go over. But I promise we'll get to them. Cool. So with this in mind, you know, when we talk about these questions in ADME, or when we talk about the questions in the exam, when he says, well, what's the percent ionization going to be? Or what's the amount that's available for absorption going to be? We can talk about it this way. So if we look at one of the questions that he asked in the ADME, he talked about morphine sulfate, which he labeled as having a pKa of four and a uh, pKb of four and a half. And he says, how much is available to enter the CNS from plasma? So if we're entering the CNS, we're going from blood through into the CNS, which means that we need to pass through a cell. So what he's asking us is how much of the drug is lipophilic, which is just another way of saying how much of the drug is uncharged. Because if you're a charged drug, it means you dissolve better in the aqueous solution like blood, and you can't pass through the cell in order to get into the CNS. Okay? So, oh wait, but we've been talking about pKa this entire time, right? Well, yeah, but what we can do is we can convert this over to pKa and be able to talk about it the same way. And another piece of information that he gave us that I just forgot to write down is that we're talking about a pH of 7.4, okay? So in order to convert pKb to pKa, we go to the water equation, which just basically looks like this, that the pKb plus the pKa equals 14. So filling in for this, we get plus pKa equals 14, which means my mental math, I think the pKa is 10 and a half, nine and a half. Someone please check my math. So now that we have the pKa, we can go
go and we can uh, set up our equation again, right? So, well, oh wait, but we don't know the which equilibrium to choose. Yes, we do. This is an acidic functional group, which means that morphine is a basic functional group, which means that, uh, basic structure I mean, which means that we're gonna be choosing the basic equilibrium equation, all right? So once again, we can just do exactly what we've done before. H plus is gonna be labeled with the pH and HB plus is gonna be labeled with our pKa, nine and a half. But I hear you say, well, why can't we just use pKb? Well, pKb is describing a base, right? So if we wanted to use pKb, we'd have to use pOH. So if you wanna use pKb, you have to pair it with a new group called POH, okay? Again, if you really wanted to do this, I think it's just more work for yourself that pH plus POH equals 14. You can convert it this way. I, I don't think it really makes sense to do it. I just keep everything pKa because we're talking about acids this entire time. Do what you want, whatever works better for you. From here, what this tells us is we go back to Mother Nature's rule about what is going to be favored, and we know that the weaker acid is going to be favored. So what this tells us is that as we get, uh, as we put the drug in solution, it's going to be ionized, okay? So in, at the pH that we care about, it is in the ionized form. So what I like to do is I like to come up with this really handy table. And it tells us the ratio of ionized to non-ionized. And then we can talk about the percent uh, uh, non-ionized to percent ionized. Well, why did I set it up this way? Why is it B and then HB plus? Because imagine that we put a line down this and we have the non-ionized and then the ionized on the right. Non-ionized on the left, non-ionized on the right. Likewise, when we write our ratio, our ratio is gonna be from B to HB plus. So what's ever on the left is gonna represent this number What's ever on the right is gonna represent that number, okay? Same thing, I can put my little colon here to help me with the ratio, and I can see, oh, the B is on the left, HB is on the, left, on the right, all right? From here, what I can, I could, of course, start off with the, you know, um, the pKa of the molecule, and I could say, okay, at nine and a half, I'm gonna have a one-to-one -one ratio right? Because at the pKa, the ionization of the drug is between, is 50-50. So I know that it's going to be one over one plus one. So how much of the drug at that form over the total number of forms, which is equal to one half or 50%. Likewise, same for the other one, one over one plus one equals 50%. Well, this is all well and good, but we want the range of pKa or the range of ionization surrounding our pH, the thing that we're looking for, right? So I think it's help helpful to craft a number line. The number line goes from zero to 14. And so we can stick in our nine and a half and we can stick in our 7.4, the pH we're working with, and what do we already know? Well, we know that as we go closer to 7.4 and beyond it, we expect that the concentration of HB plus increases, right? This is everything that we've already expected, right? So every time that we go down a step, eight and a half, seven and a half, six and a half, do we expect the left side of the ratio or the right side of the ratio to increase? Well, I know based on my analysis that HB plus is increasing. So I know 
that what's going to happen is that the ratio of charged molecule is increasing. And this is why it's important to make sure that we're keeping the uncharged molecule on the left and the charged molecule on the right when we write these ratios and stay consistent. Because when I write, eventually, if we have an acidic drug, it's going to play over like this, where, look, the non-charged portion of the drug is on the left and the charged portion of the drug is on the right. So I'm keeping things consistent, non uncharged on the left, charged on the right. But we're not talking about this right now, so I'm going to erase it. Don't want to confuse us. So this entire work, what this has done is it tells us that for this portion, we're going to be taking this left-hand side. So it's going to be 1 over 11, 10 plus 1. We're adding this ratio, and that gives us uh, about 10%. Then we're going to get 10 over 11, which gives us about 90%. Then we're going to get 1 over 101, which gives us about 1%. And that this gives us 100 over 101, which gives us about 90, uh, 99%. And then finally, 1 over 1,001 gives us about 0.1, I believe. And that 1,000 over 101, 1, 1001 gives us 99.9% .9 or practically 100, right? Well, this is all well and good. We just did a whole bunch of work, but we're still not at our answer, right? So we want to find, we know we're looking for it at a pH of 7.4. And the question is asking us how much is available to enter into the CNS, right? So we're talking about uncharged. So are we going to be, is our answer going to be this column or this column? Well, we want uncharged, right? So we're going to be choosing this column and we're going to put a box around uh, the one that gives us uh, the correct answer. So this would be, if it was asking, it would be zero to 1%. I think in this problem, he gives us like a selection of of different things. So uh, according to his thing, it would be between 99 and 100% if, uh, uh, or 99 to 100% ionized. So it's like, look at what the question is asking is essentially what it is. Does this make sense kind of? Does anybody have any questions about all this work that we just went through? Sweet. Uh, just so the big thing that this entire thing is, is like, great, we just did four rows of worth of information and I just wasted 10 minutes of my exam, right? Well, there's a way to do this faster so that way you're not doing so much math, all right? So let's look at another example, shall we? Let's look at that ibuprofen question that's above the morphine one. By the way, is this making sense so far? Can people like drop some stuff in the in the uh, chat and just let me know how I'm doing? Cool. So we're looking at the question that has ibuprofen, and this time, instead of giving us what the formulation is, he's now given us the structure. Well, same thing here. We just go back to originally what we did, right? We know that this is a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids are acidic functional groups, and that he specifically gives us a pKa of 4.7. Again, what does knowing that is, it's acidic, it means it helps us choose what the equation is going to be. So automatically, I know I'm talking about HA goes to H plus plus A minus. 
from here, I know that he's talking about the duodenum. So we're talking about a pH equals six. So I'm going to label this structure with the pKa, 0.7, and I'm going to label the duodenum as six. Good question. So the question is, if he gives us the pKb and just the structure, can we assume that the structure is basic? And the answer is no. So pKbs and pKas don't necessarily tell us if a structure is acidic or basic or not. So the, if we look at this uh, functional group over here, where was it? Maybe it was up above. If we take a look at this imine, the pKa is three and a half, which would tell us that it's pretty acidic, right? You know, pretty getting close to strong acid territory. But we know that the, even though the pKa is really low, it's still a basic functional group. So just because he gives you a pKb or pKa doesn't necessarily clue you in for what the functionality of the functional group could be, if that makes sense. Cool. Going back to this, we know that the uh, mother nature is always, always, always going to choose the weaker acid, which in this case is the duodenum. So we're going to be increasing the concentration of the charged form of this drug, right? So just to make myself a number line, which actually I'm just going to do this so I have more room. So we're increasing the charged form of the drug and to make myself just a number line so that way I can just kind of keep things clear in my head is that we have the pKa at 4.7 and we have the duodenum at six. And so as I go towards the duodenum and beyond, I know I should be increasing the concentration of the charged form of the molecule. So I said, well, we can't be doing all this math in order to figure out what's going on, right? Well, we can cut down on the table in order to figure out how to do it. So again, you're going to have to practice doing this in your head. Um, I haven't, there's no, like, I tried working with it and trying to come up with, like, different formulas and everything, but it doesn't really work. You're just going to have to do it. Um, figure it practice is essentially. And remember that we're always going to put the charged form, the uncharged form of the molecule on the left because it's on the left side of the equation. And we're always going to put the charged form of the molecule on the right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think to myself, okay, 4.7 goes up to 5.7 and then 5.7 goes up to 6.7. And 5.7 and 6.7 flank the pH that I'm looking for. So I only really need those two values. So I only need to fill in these two rows of information to really tell us what's going on. However, don't fall into the trap and say this is 50-50. It's not, because remember that at a pKa of 4.7 at our pKa, we have a ratio of one to one, right? As we jump up to 5.7, the question becomes, are we going to be increasing the A minus side or the HA side? And think, go back to what our mother nature tells us. Mother nature tells us that the form we're gonna see more of is the charged. So I'm going to be increasing the right-hand side. So it's going to be 1 to 10. Same thing. Jump up another one to 6.7. I'm increasing the right-hand side because that's the charged molecule. And I'm going to get 1 to 100. Now I can just do the ratio. So I know this is 10 over 11, which is equal to uh, 90%. And this is 100 
sorry, whoa, I did this wrong. This is one over 11, because we're talking about the left-hand side of the ratio. This should be 10%, and this should, uh, is the right-hand side of the equilibrium, so this is 10 over 11, which equals 90%. Finally, this is 1 over 101, which is equal to about 1%, and this is equal to 100 over 101, which is equal to 99%. All right, and so by restricting our bounds to what we're talking about here, we can see, oh, okay, if he asks about how much of it is unionized, we can say unionized is one to 10%, but if he's asking about ionized, he's talking about 90 to 99%. Do we see how this table is helpful? Do we see how it kind of organizes your thoughts a bit? Uh, again, like how do you get good at doing this table? Just practice, go through, do all your practice problems with this idea. Um, honestly, the biggest helpful thing that I can offer to you is just understanding this. Because if you understand the mother nature equilibrium equation, then you're golden and that will point you in the right direction about what's being asked. Some things I've noticed and things that I read in the textbook uh, that all mean the same thing. When we're talking about available for absorption, we're talking about uncharged, and when we're talking about available for excretion, we're talking about charged. Same thing if we're talking about lipophilic drugs, then we're talking about uncharged. And if we're talking about hydrophilic drugs, we're talking about charged. So these are all ways of asking the same thing. The other question that I did see that was a bit interesting to know is, um, you know, the question was how much of the drug is available for first pass, oh no, it's unavailable for first pass metabolism. And the answer that the book chose is because, be, remember that first pass metabolism, the ultimate goal is to make drugs water soluble, right? That's the goal of metabolism overall. Phase one is to deactivate the molecule, phase two is to make it water soluble through conjugation. So if you're already water soluble, you're unavailable for first pass metabolism. So when you're unavailable, it should be charged. Does every drug get metabolized by CYP450? I believe no. I, well, you know, absolutes, like I imagine that CYP450 metabolizes most drugs, but uh, I don't know if like, yeah, I'd say the greater than 90%, like, I imagine that's what it is, just because it's the most common um, enzyme in the liver. Um, but I'm sure there are certain drugs that don't do it, like whatever drugs get metabolized in the lungs. Or um, I believe we have to be told specifically which drugs don't get metabolized in the liver. Um, the I believe we're going to learn later on in like therapeutics or something like that, like, oh, this drug gets metabolized in the kidney, or oh, it gets metabolized in the lung and then that's going to play into what's going on here. Um, but this question I just thought was really interesting because it's it's kind of talking about first pass metabolism as like unavailable or available and I you know I thought it was interesting. Um, um, I don't know specifically how to determine myself um, I imagine that CYP450 
like I said, it, 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 its ultimate goal is to make drugs water soluble. So I imagine that if it's a drug that is not metabolized by CYP450, it's a very water soluble drug already. Um, so if I had to give an answer for which of the following drugs are not metabolized by CYP450, I would choose ones that are just highly soluble already. So we're talking about really polar, have lots of hydrogen bonding, uh, or maybe even a charge already. Um, that's what I would choose. Um, stuff like that. Um, all right. Um, cool. Uh, how do we feel about this? Um, do we feel good? Kind of? Uh, any questions on any of this? Is this helpful? Is this not helpful? Um, I see most of you have hung on, which usually is a good indication that what I'm doing is helpful. Um, but let me know if anything I'm talking about so far is dumb. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. All right, let's talk about, um, let's talk about uh, inductive versus resonance effect. Um, for those of you who did Orgo with me, you would have remembered that I would have spent, I think, three hours talking about this. Um, I did it today uh, with the Orgo kids. It was a lot of fun. Um, just kidding. No, it was not. Um, what I have given you, if you go on the Gabe Tutoring link, if you look in the um, the fourth fourth year uh, folder, tu tutoring, um, in the fourth year folder, there's that MedChem, and it has just a uh, Word document that's the exact same notes that I've given you. Um, but I figured that I would just explain it, and if people have questions, they can ask me. Um, cool. So basically for inductive versus resonance, I'll show you the trick that I use that works about 80 to 90% of the time. There's very few exceptions, and we're talking about like multiple ring structures that usually is the exception. So the first kind of molecule that we can have is an aromatic molecule. So we're talking about something that's a benzene ring, or we're talking about it like a furan, or we're talking about um, something else. It's tinyurl.com slash Gabe Tutoring is the link up here. Um, if you have me on Snapchat as well, my Snapchat is Surfrin. I post a whole bunch of stuff on there. People who have me know that I'm really annoying about posting stuff on there. But it always seems to be like either helpful or not helpful or always about tutoring. How do I do it? Uh, nobody knows. So what I'm going to tell you is that for position Z, so for this position, we can come up with a couple of assumptions based on what it is. If Z has a lone pair, then it undergoes uh, donating through resonance. So what do I mean by this? I mean like if we have a phenol, for example, this lone pair that's on the oxygen can be donated into the ring. Notice how it's going towards the ring and that we're making a negative charge on the ring. Oops, sorry, this should have a negative charge because we're talking about the conjugate phase. All right, so this is donating into the ring, so we can call it an electron donating group, or an EDG, all right? And what it does is it donates via resonance. Well, how do we know it's resonance? Like, what, it, what is resonance, really? 
Resonance is just a fancy way of saying pie donation. Oh, well, that doesn't sound like any more down to earth way of explaining what we're talking about. Pie donation. What the fuck? Well, all we're saying here is we're talking about lone pairs or we're talking about double bonds. That's all it is. So that's what resonance is in general. And if you are in the Z position and you have a lone pair, you do donation via resonance. Okay. Other examples of the same sort of shebang. Esters, where the ester portion is on the ring. Notice that the Z position is taken up by that oxygen. Nitrogen, where the Z position is taken up by the nitrogen, has that lone pair. Um, uh, another one. Oh, aniline. Aniline has that nitrogen with the lone pair right there. So you can see that there's multiple, like you can swap things out as much as you want, right? So if we're talking about one group and the group has a lone pair, we're talking about donation through resonance. By contrast, by the way, this is all in that Word document as well. Um, if you if you miss anything. By contrast, when we're talking about the Z group, wow, my benzene rings are getting really bad right now. If Z has a carbonyl or is involved in a double bond, it's doing uh, withdrawing via resonance. Withdrawing via resonance. So what's a good example of this? Well, we're talking about a ketone. Right? Well, why does this happen? The reason is, well, withdrawing is all about removing electrons from. So what we can see happen is that this double bond can move and what we create is a resonance structure where we have a removed electron density from the benzene ring. All right, and so we have withdrawn electrons, so we can call this an electron withdrawing group, an EWG. So the process is withdrawing through resonance, the group itself is called an electron withdrawing group. All right, what are examples of different functional groups? Well, anything that puts a carbonyl or a double bond at the Z position. So we can have things like, let me copy this so I don't have to keep redrawing. We can have things like an aldehyde. Oh look, at the Z position we have a carbonyl. We can have things like a carboxylic acid, carbonyl at the Z position. We can have things like an ester. Oh, but I thought you said esters were electron donating. No, ester where the carbonyl portion is at the Z position are withdrawing. So it depends on which end of the ester is doing the job. Amids. Well, what if instead we had a carbon with a double bond? 
same thing. Carbon's involved with the double bond means it's withdrawing as well. Likewise, well, what if we had another benzene ring? Same thing. The carbon at the Z position is involved in a, uh, in a double bond, so this is electron withdrawing. Okay? But wait, I hear you say, what if we have something like quinolone? Right? Here's quinolone. And I hear you say to me, but you said things like nitrogens and stuff, that was electron donating, right? Why did you lie to me? Why did you come up with rules that don't always work? I didn't lie to you. Ha, ha, ha. This nitrogen does not have a lone pair on it. It does not have a lone pair. So it cannot, uh, does it have a lone pair? It does have a lone pair. Um, this lone pair, however, it does have a lone pair. However, this lone pair is not able to participate in resonance. So you can't donate it this way like an electron donating group would do. You can't put a double bond there. That doesn't work. So even though ha 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 it may have a lone pair, this does not participate in resonance forms. However, look at this other z position up here. This z position is still involved in a double bond, so it's still electron withdrawing, I believe. I am like 80% sure on this, actually 90%. Um, any questions, anything like that? Good so far? This should pretty much be straightforward, everything like that. All right, well, here's the issue. What if our Z group is something like a methyl group, right? What if it's a methyl group? Or what if instead it's a halogen? Well, funny enough, we're going to talk about methyl groups in a second, but what I want you to know about halogens is that they don't really undergo uh, resonance. Um, for the most part, they don't do uh, uh, like direct electron, like withdrawing with resonance or donating with resonance. They don't do it. They can't form that resonance structure. So for all intents and purposes, we're not going to be considering halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, as lone pair, uh, groups with lone pairs. Um, because these do not undergo um, resonance. So what are we going to do about these groups that don't have lone pairs or don't have carbonyls or don't have double bonds? Well, we're going to follow the aliphatic mean, or we're going to follow the aliphatic rules. Where am I looking? Looking here. Okay. So this is what I'm going to tell you. If you have a position Z like this, if you have something like that, all right, and at position Z, you have a very electronegative atom, Sorry, what am I saying? Electro negative atom. Or you have a positive charge within the Z group. These are going to be uh, uh, withdrawing inductively. Okay? These are going to be withdrawing inductively. 
So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about things like I'm talking about things like a halogen. All right, this is highly electronegative, or I'm talking about fluorinated groups like CF3. Those are also going to be withdrawing inductively. Uh, talking about OH groups, oh, that's going to be withdrawing uh, inductively, or maybe an NH, or even if I wanted to put something like a carboxylic acid. All right. But wait, you said that carboxylic acids were with withdrawing resonance, right? Why did we just change the game? Well, remember that in order to do resonance, we need a double bond in this position. So we're not talking about an aromatic group. We're talking about a group that has no resonance potential. Not always. So there are it's usually, so the question was, I thought it was always withdrawing inductively. Not always. There's a couple of exceptions that show withdrawing donation, but it will always be inductive. You won't find resonance uh, with aliphatic, All right? What's a, an idea of like a positively charged substance? It'd be something like an be something like an NH3 group. Look, that positive charge. Or the one that ends up getting people all the time is nitro groups. You see it as NO2. This nitro group looks like this. Where this positive charge uh, cancels out this negative charge. And so the group itself is neutral, but there is a positive charge and you have highly electronegative groups in there. So this is also going to be withdrawing inductively. All right. So in general, when in doubt, if you can't remember, just choose withdrawing inductively. However, for the few exceptions that are donating inductively, what I will tell you is that if Z Sorry, if Z is electro negatively neutral, or if Z is negatively charged, these will be donating inductively, okay? What are examples of this? Well, what I mean by electronegatively neutral is that if you just have another carbon chain, carbon and carbon have the same electronegativity, so they're going to be essentially neutral to each other. So if you have some sort of, you know, chain that comes off, this is all going to be neutral to the group, to our drug, and so these are all going to be donating inductively. Okay? A negatively charged species like O minus of course is going to be donating that negative charge into the structure. Look, it's highly negative. It's going to have an excess of negative. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, donating. Let me double check. No, no, no. This is going to be withdrawing. So. The only example that I can find of a negatively charged species that has that's donating inductively is where the negative charge is um, is placed on not the Z position. So 
it, it, like, how can I explain this? Uh, I guess this is really, this isn't necessarily a rule. It's kind of just a thing. I'm going to keep it there because that's how I think about it. But, but O minus is a withdrawing inductive. Would it be? No, no, no. I'm not wrong. Why did I second guess myself? I know I'm right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not crazy. Even O minus is going to be donating electron density into the structure because it is so high in electrons that it is going to be pushing some of it back into the drug structure, which is why if you see a O minus on our, uh, on our, what's it called, on their exam, and it's on just a regular uh, chain, this is going to be donating inductively, like 95% sure. Likewise, if you have something like this, this is still a negatively charged species, so this is going to be donating inductively as well. So there's only really two examples of what's going on. It's either carbon chain or it's negative. That's the only things that we care about. Does this make sense? In the practice he gave us, there was only one instance of donating inductively, but that doesn't mean that there can't be more instances of it on the exam. Okay? So I have a question for you. If we have a um, if we have a chain like this, here's our drug. But the group that's added on is a benzene ring. So this is the group. This is Z. Is this withdrawing inductively or donating inductively? Well, this is going to be withdrawing inductively. The reason is because we can get a resonance structure that puts a positive charge. Actually, would it be neutral? Thank you. Would it be neutral? Actually, I believe actually it's going to be neutral. I'll have to double check this. But my reasoning for this is because this structure overall is electrically neutral. There's no charge going on here, and there's no electronegativity in here that would make it any different than this carbon. So this falls under the first rule in donating inductively. Um, so if I was on the exam, I would choose donating inductively, I believe. Um, I'm 95% sure about that as well. How do we feel so far? Do we feel good? Do we feel not so good? Um, are we all ready for this exam? <coughs> How do we feel? What I would say is, if this was confusing, it might just be the way that it looks or the way that it's formatted. Go take a look at um, go take a look at the thing I put up because this will this just really simplifies it and puts it in a very very clear way. Um, what I imagine that he'll do is he'll put up a drug and he'll be like, "What effect does?" the amid have on diltiazem or what effect does this have on morphine or on whatever we're talking about um and then this will just explain you know what's going on um you know well if it's a carboxylic acid and the carbonyl is at the z position then we know it's withdrawing 
that's all it is. It really is very straightforward. Um, I don't I don't believe these questions are going to be the hardest part of the exam. I believe the hardest part is going to be trying to do all that math in our heads, uh, which I am not particularly looking forward to. Um, it is a bit to absorb. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a lot more memorization than I would want there to be, but it is what it is. Okay, uh, to go back to those questions that John uh, wanted us to just take a look at, if it was seven and 15, seven and 15. Um, Okay, um, I believe this came from the book. Um, so a lot of this, maybe he went over, um, did these come from the book? Yeah, the, the slides are really dense. Um, so the question is in writing, the chemical name for with a, of a drug, the chloro substituent on the fused ring must be given number and then the answer the choices are five three four two seven i don't know if this is really on our exam because i I think I remember Sridhar saying that we don't necessarily have to care about doing this. I think we just have to identify heterocycles. I don't think we have to name heterocycles. Um, but what it's basically saying is, what's the IUPAC writing, what's the IUPAC naming scheme for when we put a chlorine on a fused ring, okay? So a fused ring is something like dibenzo. Or another way of saying this is Decalin, I believe, I can't remember. So we have a dibenzyl ring. And it's saying, well, what if we put the chlorine there? On the ring, it must be given number. So the answer here is two, I believe, if I remember correctly, about naming fused rings. And the reason, this is a non exam, right? Am I crazy? I don't remember doing this in class. Is that if that, what is this question? I don't believe we need to know this. I don't think this question is on our exam, John. Um, oh, okay. This is probably not on our, so this, he says it comes from an old exam. Um, I'm gonna say that this is probably not on our exam because I was talking to Sridhar and Sridhar said that he specifically took out all the naming um, from the exam. So uh, we don't necessarily have to worry about this. Um, but to answer your question, it would be given two because this is 1A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4A, 5, 6, 7. That's, that's why. Um, 
So I don't believe we have to worry about that. Don't worry about that question. Uh, the other one that you said you wanted us to take a look at was uh, the basic character of the three nitrogen atoms shown in the module below is in the order of. Oh, this is a good question. Okay, so this is a question that we are able to do. And it's basically saying, given this drug, Given this drug, by the way, this should say NH2 on it, my bad. For this nitrogen, this nitrogen, and this nitrogen, rank them in order of basicity. Okay. So the question is, well, which, which one is, rank them in order of basicity. So the we want the strongest base over here and we want the weaker one over here. All right. And I'll label this one, this will be two and this will be three. Or actually to stay consistent with what the exam one is, I'll label it the way that he did it. So this is one down here, this is two over here, and this is three over there. All right, so we want the strongest base and we want the weakest base. Well, how do we go about that? Well, what we can do is we can take a look at the PKAs that we have memorized. So we know that this is an aliphatic amine, and a phallic, aliphatic amine has a PKA of around 10, right? This is a, a pyridine, and pyridines and all aromatic amines have a pKa of around two. And then we have an amid, and we didn't necessarily learn this pKa. So this PK is around seven and a half. Thank you. All right. So it's talking about base, right? Well, these are all acidity constants. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert these into pKb because then we can talk about pKb, right? So the pKb, remember, pKb is pKa plus pKb equals 14. So the pKb of this amine is 4. The pKb of this pyridine is 12. And the pKb of this amid is, oh God, six and a half. Look at that quick math. And so we have four, which would be stronger than six and a half, which would be stronger than 12. And the same way that we can say low pKa means strong acid, we can say low pKb means strong base. So the strongest base in this case would be three, followed by two, followed by one. Do you have to convert to pKb? No, you do not. We can look at it in terms of strength of pKa, and we can say it's 2, 7 and a half, 10, which would be labeling this as 1, 2, 3, 
and we can just take the reverse order. So it would be three, two, one. So you could just take the uh, reverse of the pKa if you really wanted to. Less math, but yeah, you could totally, totally do that. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I don't believe I really have anything else planned for tonight. Pretty much everything else is memorization. Uh, this is basically all the tips and tricks and stuff from Organic Chem that I know that I could just bring to the table for you. Um, this recording usually takes half an hour to upload, so just check out my Snapchat. I'll, I'll let you know when it goes up. Um, it'll go on the um, YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com slash Gabe tutoring yt feel free to hit that subscribe button ring that bell slap that like button i think there's another thing i'm supposed to say but i can't remember um do whatever you want uh cool i think that's everything i have for you um do can you just repeat the thing about voiding first pass metabolism for quick Please don't, I don't have an OnlyFans, but if people, I will make a Gabe Tutoring OnlyFans if I have to, if that's what people want me to do. Um, don't mind. Uh, yeah, where was that? Where did I say that? So, I believe what this question was talking about um, was how much of the drug is unavailable for first pass metabolism. Well, remember that first pass metabolism is all about making drugs water soluble, right? First one, phase one is to, uh, to deactivate the drug. Phase two is to conjugate it and make it water soluble. So if you have, if you're unavailable for first pass metabolism, then you're most likely already charged. So if you don't need to go through first pass metabolism, it's because you're already charged, you're already ready to be excreted, um, is what I believe this question was asking. And so what it's essentially asking is how much of the drug is already ionized at the pH that we're talking about. Yeah, Justin, I was very confused why Elaine was speaking with a man's voice. Um, but you know, it's 2020. We can't judge um, everything like that. Cool. All right. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, the everything like that. Um, I don't know how many of these MedChem reviews I'm going to be able to do um, purely because I don't know a lot about MedChem. I'm learning it with you guys, um, but it should be all set. Good luck, get some sleep, memorize your shit, um, and uh, get fucked. The good old Gabe Tutoring sign off. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>